thought Harold was going to do an introduction, but uh, just to move this along, um, let me, uh, you all know me. Steve Gittemall is here this morning. Um, Gary Hines, who's uh, uh, is uh, managing director of uh, uh, Delaware. Um, what is the other the other fund? He's got some other. No, no, he's got some LLCs that I've been thinking more about. So um, the other Delaware Bay uh, company. Sorry, Matt Dundon, who's the president and managing director of uh, Dundon Advisors. Uh, we're very happy to have. Um, Very happy to have with us Dave Miller for the fourth or fifth year from Elliott uh, Management, and uh, uh, Dave just had a, a big, real big promotion last year. I think he's now uh, one of the senior managing directors at that firm. And, um, and at the end, we have uh, Richard Fells, the, uh, the senior managing director at Odeon Capital, and one of my longtime friends and uh, a former panelist uh, at this panel for many years. Uh, so we were going to start off. And I'm going to sit down when we start off. Uh, so this, I really want everyone to hear from these guys. Gary, by the way, has already given me grief about my morning presentation. So he says, I, uh, so all you guys that have been texting him and tweeting him and emailing him, it did it did ring through. So he's he's taking me out to the woodshed after this after uh, the, after we have drinks. So, um, all right, but my the first question I'd like to do uh, uh, for the group is, are you bullish or bearish about the market? Can it go higher from here? Just tell us a general concepts about that and then I want to get into uh, some thoughts about uh, what the market is telling us a little bit about the presidential election since that's so over uh, weaning of everything in my mind over the next year and then we'll get into some uh, particular industries and then we have some specific credits to talk about uh, which will be teed up a little bit by our discussion here uh, we will get to PG&E probably Fann Fannie Mae for sure and then uh, a couple maybe uh, uh, industry other credits that we've We've been talking, so Gary, if I don't mind, if you don't mind being leading off, uh, do you want to uh, just uh, start off on your uh, view sure. of? Right. Um, I'm fairly bullish on the market. I guess I would say I think it's a uh, pretty well fully priced in here. Um, I back. I say I'm bullish, but I, I would not be surprised to see some sort of a pullback. But uh, longer term, I'm. I think the economy is in good shape. Um, I think, and this goes to your second question on here, I think the market's telling us it doesn't matter what's going to happen in November. It doesn't matter whether it's Trump. They don't believe it's going to be anybody, any of the far left people, I think. Um, oh, you, I'm not taking the bait there, Steve. I'm just saying. <laughs> um, but I, I think the market's telling you that, uh, you know, we're in for some, some good times. And every time I come to this conference, we usually, the, of course, the panels have changed now, but... Uh, usually, it's uh, the sky is falling. Even in the best of times, the sky is going to fall, and of course, it's sometimes it will. So at some point, it will. But I'm 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 fairly optimistic. Great, Matt. Uh, thanks. I mean, I spend most of my time thinking about the the scarier end of the risk spectrum, and and I'm not terribly scared about the scarier end of the risk spectrum. I I, I think that that there there is a strong uh, strong underpinning of demand. I think there's a strong underpinning of capital spending. Uh, so from both the business and consumer side, I think there's a lot of the tailwinds that people with uh, shaky capital structures need. I, I think that the market has been developing better discipline over the last couple of years of, at sort of kind of horses that just can't have another run around the track shooting them in the head. <laughs> and so there, there, there's been a, you know, the, the amount of zombie companies uh, are, are are relatively few, so I, I like the market and and I like uh, I I like higher spread credit and I like the tougher equities. I think a lot of them have uh, have more upside than downside uh, where we are now for the for the year to come. Uh, Dave, I mean I think that <clears throat> the market's been reacting favorably in recent months to. Um, you know, the idea that the Fed will be aggressive and, and gets it and gets the fragility that, uh, um, you know, is, has been demonstrated by the economy. Um, I'm sorry, Dave, when you say Fed will be aggressive, you mean by keeping the rates low? Right. Okay. And I think that's really underpinned the market performance in, in recent totally months agree. and has been, you know, by far and away the single biggest 
factor. I do think that as we move closer to the election, that will move more and more to the forefront. And, you know, that's really, you know, we're going to, we're going to end up either with a candidate that by most conventional uh, measures would likely be considered, you know, relatively business unfriendly, almost no matter which democratic candidate is elected, or we're going to end up with a continuation uh, of a regime that has been increasingly uh, Unpredictable, um, and uh, seemingly, you know, would be in a second term, untethered by electoral uh, considerations, and could become even more unpredictable still. So, I don't know, you know, if either of those scenarios is a is a great outcome from a market standpoint. And so, I, I would be cautious myself uh, as to the market generally. Excellent, okay. uh, Richard. Yeah, thank you. Um, well, simply put, stay invested. Stay invested through this uh, re-election year coming up. Um, I expect this year's credit bifurcation to extend into 2020 uh, as we continue to see lower credit quality issuers um, continue to underperform. And then, Steve, if you would allow me, I, I just want to refer to my notes, and I'll dovetail right into your next topic. Okay. Um, presidential election thoughts. And I found this, these factoids quite interesting. Going back to 1928, there have been 23 presidential elections. Only four of those 23 elections experienced a loss in the S&P 500 during the election year itself, the most recent being the 37% loss in 2008. In 13 of those elections, the sitting president was seeking re-election. The S&P 500 saw a negative return in just two of those re-election years, 1932 and 1940. Stocks were down 8.6% and 10.7% respectively in those years. In 1932, for the history buffs here, FDR defeated Herbert Hoover, who lost his re-election bid while FDR was re-elected in 1940 over Wendell Wilkie. So there's not much precedent in terms of stocks seeing a down year during a re-election campaign. And I think that's very telling regardless of uh, who the candidate was. Great, that is uh, our, the, the next topic we were gonna talk, we are gonna talk about is the, um, how, how do you believe the market is start, has the market started forming opinions about the result of the US election? And uh, I'm just going to go a little out of turn here. I'm gonna I'd like to start with Matt and then go back to um, Dave and then uh, Richard if you have to follow and then Gary and myself. Uh, Matt, would you like to kick us off? Kick us off so so while I, I am constructive about the broader market, I, 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 I sit with great perplexion looking at the way that, that the, the market in, in health insurance, HMOs, and healthcare providers is regarding potential policy change. Um, you know, right now we're at the position where, where two candidate Democratic Party candidates for president, Senators Warren and Sanders, who combined are in the clear number one position in the polls, are pledging to effectively outlaw a, a very significant segment of, of, of the private sector health care providing uh, in this country, you know, and, and by outlaw I mean you know, Medicare for all does not mean nationalizing hospitals and making every doctor work for the state. It does mean making everybody work for Medicare rates. And that may be six of one, half dozen of the other for anybody with significant leverage, um, unless you happen to be an operator that is overwhelmingly weighted to Medicaid facilities, in which case you'll actually benefit because uh, the, the, those proposals have in common that Medicaid goes away and Medicaid rates move up to the Medicare rate structure. Um, and, and here's the thing, you, you don't have to believe that it is more likely than not, as an investor, let's take off our policy hats, as an investor, you don't have to believe it's more likely than not that it's going to happen. You simply have to believe that the market at some point in the next six to nine months is going to perceive a significant risk that it's going to happen. And then you look at the sort of uh, ex implied and expressed option structure in that market and say, you know, can you put on trade that pays off five to one, 10 to one, if people say, whoa, Medicare for all has a one in three chance of happening, 
uh, instead of the one in a hundred chance that's priced in today. Matt, let me, let, let me just start with you. Sure. I, I want you to continue, but I just, what, what, what Matt's saying, let me use the football analogy, right? So at the beginning of a season, you think uh, a couple years ago, we had the uh, Los Angeles Rams. They were two and 14 or something. I had the top pick in the draft. At the beginning of that year, they went, uh, they, 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 the odds of them winning, uh, going to the Super Bowl is one in 500. So if you put down a $1 bet, you get $500 back if they make it to the Super Bowl. The Rams had turned things around that offseason or whatever. They brought some new players in, drafts and all that. They come out and they win, let's, I think, uh, three of their first five games. Maybe it was an easy schedule because they were such a lousy team, not an easy schedule. So they go three and two. All of a sudden, their odds for the Rams to go to Super Bowl go from one in 500 to one in 100, right? So that's, if you would, and, and betters can do this, and certainly we are, we don't, necessarily bet on sports games, but that's, that change of the ratio from 1 to 500 odds to 1 to 100 odds, if you're short and long the right, in the right uh, ratios, you've just qu you know, quintupled your money. So it's like that. So just, just because they go 3-2, and two, they're not necessarily going to the Super Bowl. In fact, that year that I'm thinking about, they didn't, but uh, the next year they did. Uh, they, didn't, they didn't go to Super Bowl, nor did they win it, but the odds changed. And so that's what kind of Matt is saying, is that, uh, uh, that, right. that just – some things could happen in the next couple of months that this, these optionalities change. Well, so it's just think about it's, it's, it's the derivative, right? It, it's not that it's going to happen. It's that an increase in the risk that it's going to happen can be incredibly propulsive to uh, trades that are tuned to that sensitivity. Um, and, and I think it's, it's interesting because we have whole sectors in, in energy and technology where the market is aggressively pricing and thinking about that kind of change, whether it's being driven by innovation or, or whether it's being driven by policy and, and somehow healthcare in, in part because I, I think one problem is you're refighting the last war. There were people who felt that, that the uh, uh, Obamacare was going to be bad for health providers in the private sector. And of course, as it turned out, Obamacare was precisely tuned just to scoop tens of billions of dollars out of every other sector of the economy and move it into private healthcare hands, and indeed, perhaps that is one potential outcome for a Sanders-Warren presidency, is, is that by the time it got through Congress, it would just be a, yet another massive subsidy to private providers of healthcare. But that's not what they're saying, right? That's not what they're saying, and it's relatively straightforward to look at a spectrum of healthcare facilities and HMO providers and say, what does a move to the policies that they are saying they want to implement mean for the profitability and credit of these companies? And pick some obvious <coughs> losers. So, um, so put some numbers to the. Well, put some numbers to. You mentioned. Well, Anthem. let me do that. I, I can add sure. some data yeah. points to support what Matt is uh, is saying. Um, the HMO's resilience uh, with the upcoming election is surprising, and I'm going to point out the IHF uh, um, Healthcare Provider Index. It's a hundred plus names from October 1st to today that index is up just over 18 percent. Um, you can take a look at United Healthcare, which is a big factor in that index, for just those two months, up 18.7 percent. Uh, CVS, Cigna, all up 17 to 20 percent. What is that telling us? And I think those are the data points you're going to need. The oh, to add to that, that's just the equity. The credit spreads on these names are narrower than they've ever been, and the equity market caps keeps charging ahead. I so think that's a big signal. The conclusion being, what do you say? Uh, the conclusion being that uh, Sanders and um, Warren don't have a chance. <laughs> or if they do... If they do, their policy will not be enforced. Yeah, because it could be they saying both. It could be clearly saying both. Right. 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 So maybe it's also saying that, well, and I made this comment in our discussion the other day, that if actually Sanders and, uh, and or Warren were to be the nominee and then get elected, the odds are that both the, houses of Senate would probably also go Democrat. I mean, that, that, he, I, I, right. I don't see them being elected and not it being a, sort of a Democratic mm -hmm. landslide. Right. right. I mean, the, 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 the independents that, you know, jumped over right. to that side. So, um, so then you would, so in which case, that to Matt's point, you, this thing could be completely mispriced if that actually has a reality, or to Matt's point, it's Correct. a zero probability. Because, right, it could be a great short. Because, because what you guys were saying the other day on the phone was that if we have a split house, then it won't get enacted. But if, 
if they're getting elected, it's not. I think it's not going to be a split house. Right. It's and therefore, then right. it could be mispriced. But the data doesn't say that right the now. The data doesn't say that. So it's saying maybe more than we thought. But Matt, you talked about Anthem the other day, just to give some numbers, because right now the con it's a little conceptual. Tell us what you think about Anthem. And well, just well, so so right now we, we have, you know, when you look at both both proposals, many of the proposals, and, and I think the, the proposals across the Democratic spectrum are going to get more left-leaning, uh, they, for a greater or lesser extent, dispose of what is the, the employer-based health care system in this country, which every HMO depends on. Uh, and some, and including pr Anthem, prices. have a, a Medicaid and Medicare administrative business, but it's a, a business that, once again, when you look at the white papers, they are saying, you know, it is precisely the so-called administrative expense of the large HMOs that, that needs to be done away with. It's standing between patients and care. And once you don't have to believe it. You just have to think it's, it has a slight chance of happening. Um, and, and I'm not saying Anthem is the one to short because Anthem has – you know, a lot of equity, and it does have tight credit spreads. You know, it's one of the ones you need to model so, so and run, run through their sectors and see what Medicare for All looks like for them, and where you'd buy those bonds. Um, but w one broader well, hold, point. Hold, let right me just jump in. So, Anthem a few minutes ago was trading at two eighty-seven a share, roughly. Okay. Sure. In if Sanders or Warren were to be elected, and and it w and you have two Democratic, you know, uh, House and the Senate go Democratic, what would that stock be worth in your mind? depending on the iterations of the structure, it could be worth down to zero, right? If it has no customers, it doesn't matter what its market cap is now. Okay. There's not one person in the country who wants to be an Anthem customer. Every, every employer in the country would love to not provide health care to their employees. So that, right? so, so it zero. goes from a $70 billion market cap to essentially zero. Mm -hmm. I mean, I mean I if that's the way the policy goes. If that's the way the policy goes. Okay, great. Dave, you want to either add to that or, or just send us in a different direction on that topic? Yeah, sure. I mean, um, I guess you're making the case that Anthem is pricing in a, in all likelihood, a significantly above 50% probability of a Trump victory. I think there are probably other stocks that are pricing in a below 50% probability of a Such Trump victory. I'd say stocks in the oil and gas sector, stocks in the prison sector and the coal sector. Um, and I think the, the common theme is that they're discounted on both sides just because of the uncertainty. Um, I think it's hard to s for anyone to say that there's much higher or lower than a 50% probability in either direction in with respect to this election uh, because it's, you know, the numbers are just so tight in terms of the electoral math. Um, and we're so far out, frankly, <laughs> and there's so much time in, in, you know, for things to, to happen that could affect um, the outcome on either direction. So, though, with, uh, though having said that, uh, we all know that equity markets in particular look out a year, year and a half ahead, right? That's a, they're, they're supposed to be, the bond markets are more immediate, but the equities are thinking ahead. I'm not to say they have the answer, but they are. Those guys should be thinking about it. Sure, I think I think though that when it comes to, you know, the political landscape, things can change just so much more quickly than they can, Absolutely. you know, in terms Absolutely. of the economic situation generally, but. In terms of the last question on the board, um, you know, what would the market do if Trump were not to be reelected? You know, I think the the knee jerk reaction is that the market will trade up if Trump's reelected, and it will trade down if any of the Democratic candidates win. But um, I think it's a different question as to how the market reacts to Trump's you know prosecution of a second term along the way. You know, following that knee jerk uh, move higher. Great, great. What do you think about? choice of uh, another candidate? Like, suppose Mayor Mike gets involved. Uh, well, I think it's likely, you know, too late for there to be another Republican candidate because we're already now starting to go through the deadlines in different states mm -hmm. for uh, primary registration, um, although there could be a, you know, conservative write-in uh, candidate. Um, but unfortunately for the Republican Party, the, you know, the, the opportunity to uh, install a more, you uh, Conventional uh, candidate is is it, it, it's passed us by. Uh, you know, impeachment would have needed to have happened sooner uh, for that to be in the cards. So, uh, so, Gary, we're saving the best for last, as always. <laughs> <laughs> so, so. I, I think I already and answered it, that. May I say also a little bit about your resume in the background that you were a former, uh, and maybe still, I don't know, maybe uh, under the under the table still are the uh, Democratic uh, uh, 
uh, leader of the of Delaware. I was I was chairman of the Delaware uh, uh, Democratic, Democratic Party. Democratic that Party. was during the Clinton administration when we were, by the way, balancing the budget, and we had gotten rid of the thirty-year bond. Yeah, why yeah. did you do you that? Remember those days? They're back. Remember now. those they days? Got that 30 -year bond. Remember those days? <laughs> um, I think I actually answered that question at the very beginning. I, I think the market's telling us it doesn't matter which. You know, we were saying if you have any like any, anything any evidence <coughs> in the sense that that shows one way or the other that the market's already starting to think that and is sort of pricing that in. Pricing in and out. Well, no, just the the evidence is what it is. I, I mean, the markets does not seem to be concerned either way. Okay. So, uh, and I, I do think the market's telling you that, uh, despite what Leon Cooperman says, that uh, there's just no way that one of these. Well, I, well, I won't name names, but uh, we refer to them as the uh, the wackos uh, on our side. Um, that they're just not going to let get elected. And if they did, um, I think there's enough moderate to centrist people in the Democratic Party in the House and the Senate that, that these these high in the sky promises are just aren't they're just not going anywhere. And I, I do want to take some credit for biting my tongue right there. So yeah, I, I, I I just, just between us. Okay. Yeah. Um, but we, that's a great segue. We, we always try to not take the other the other's bait, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a great segue for um, your thoughts about F, uh, Fannie Mae, because for me, I mean, this is a this is a stock that <coughs> is so in, has so much government involvement. Obviously, uh, I think under the current administration, when, I mean, after the dust settled. They're looking to do perhaps an IPO, perhaps keep it on the public on the government's balance sheet, perhaps not keep it on the government's balance sheet, maybe get paid and take it off. Where do you see that going? And, and uh, the stock, uh, for those in the audience, uh, just a few minutes ago was that uh, the, the, the equity is about 264, and the uh, preferreds um, are about 1071. That's a $25 preferred. That's uh, publicly traded. Well, uh, for starters, the the GSEs, as they were referred to, they're, they're not on the government's balance sheet. They never have been. And that's the reason why they, when they took them over, they kept 19.1% uh, of the, or excuse me, 20.1% of the stock in public hands because if the government had, had warrants to buy 80% of the stock instead of 79.9, then it would have gone on the balance sheet. Okay. And you would have had the right, right, national right. debt the skyrocket up by, you know, $5 trillion or something like that. <laughs> Uh, I'm sure Standard & Poor's would not look yeah, favorably upon that. Yeah. Um, but, you know, recently, um, you, th there's been, as, as somebody wrote, uh, Richard, it might have been somebody at your firm, uh, there's been more progress in the last five months than there has been in the last five years. But there's also been a, a number of developments on the court side. I attended a hearing in Washington uh, about a week ago, and um, our position at, at the Delaware Bay Company is we've always been very, very, uh, much in favor of the preferreds rather than the common. Uh, and I, in fact, I think across our accounts, we probably own 95% preferred and 5% common. And Bill Ackman and I had a discussion about this oh, two, three years ago, and he was trying to convince me that I should get out of my common, uh, out of my preferred and get into common because, you know, it could be a 10 bagger. Um, and of course, at the time, the preferreds were trading at around four bucks and, you know, four by, you know, four into 25 is six and change. And I said, you know, Bill, I, I've already got a six bagger. I don't need a 10 bagger. And by the way, I'm ahead of you um, because I'm preferred. And we had a lengthy discussion and about <laughs> And a few months later, he announced that he was adding preferred as a hedge to his position, but whatever. Um, so I, 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 I preface what I'm, what I'm about to say with that because I, I'm, I'm not here to hype uh, common stock. However, after attending this court hearing last year, or last week rather, oh. um, there's one lawsuit in particular that uh, was on the docket. There's about 12 that are all involving the preferred and what's called the net worth sweep. And I don't know how many, I don't want to go into a half an hour discussion of what the net worth sweep is, but. But it's a cascade. Yeah, yeah it, was, it was challenging the government's decision in 2012 to change the terms of their preferred stock from a 10% coupon to a 100% coupon. Um, that's been the, the main issue. But there's one sh uh, lawsuit that was filed as soon as the uh, conservatorships were imposed in 2008. And it challenges the legality of that itself. 
It's not the legality of the net worth sweep. It's the legality of the seizure itself. And the judge down there in Washington uh, was very, very critical of the circumstances leading up to the takeover in 2008. Um, I've written extensively on this, and, and I, I refer to it not as a bailout, but as a stick-up. <laughs> and, you know, Henry Paulson and company and, and the big banks did a masterful job for about 10 years of uh, telling the world that we had to do this to save them. They were going to bring down the system and blah, 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 even though they were in full capital compliance and I can go on and on and on and on. But they've done a great job of, of promoting a false negative. And in the last year or so, uh, people have begun to figure it out. And in particular, this one particular judge has figured it out. And um, I'm going to be writing a piece on this later this week or early next week. But a lot of the documents uh, involved with that time are under seal because at the time that they took them over, the government got the, gover the, government got the court to uh, say, oh, the public can't see any of these documents because it, it, it could affect national security. You know, the old bug, that it's always national security. Or it could start a whole new financial crisis. Well, here we are, 11 Just years, 12 years later, you know. And anyway, there are some very interesting things filed in this court last week. And if you, many of the documents are redacted. And if you read between the lines, it's, you don't even have to know what's blacked out. It's, if you read the sentence before and the sentence after, it's, it's very, very incriminating to the government. And the real story is eventually going to come out, which means that the government who wants to put this thing, get them out of conservatorship, they're going to have to come to terms not only with the preferred shareholders, but with the common shareholders. The common shareholders, in my opinion, are now back in play because the preferred holders and a lot of big holders, uh, 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 there are a lot of large preferred holders, they can make a deal with the government, but no deal with the government is going to fly unless the preferred holders, excuse me, the common holders get taken care of. So I'm much more bullish on the common now than I was a month ago because they, they have some real leverage here. But are you, are you bullish for a prospective purchaser of common that would purchase the stock now? Because my understanding of that uh, argument was that the judge was very favorably disposed to finding damages um, for purchasers of the stock prior to the sweep, um, but seemed to be extremely skeptical that post-sweep purchasers would have standing. That and issue comes up all the time, and I think when the judge looks at the precedent, she's going to find that you, you can't discriminate between who owned the stock on that day and who owns it today. In fact, I, I believe, I could be wrong on this, that there's binding precedent in her circuit in the Roth versus the FDIC case, going back to Meritor, mm -hmm. where a holder of the Meritor common stock who sold it in right after the bank was taken over intervened in the slattery suit to say that any damage award should go to the people who owned stock on the day of the takeover of the bank. And that got litigated at the very end after everything else was done. And the FDIC, the government of all people, came in and s solidly refuted Roth's position. And sure enough, the uh, Federal Circuit decided, no, it, it, it go, it, it's, it's, this goes back to Alexander Hamilton. When you buy a share of stock, you buy all the rights that, that go with it. I, and I, think we, I think we've had that. Yeah, we've had, had this many, issue, many but, but, but it comes up, and it really, who promotes it is the government saying, oh, we can't have these greedy hedge funds make money at did the taxpayer's in, expense. Did that come up in next wave? I, mean, I, th I think it did. I think, but I think this, is, this is, you know. But it's a great question. Right. It, and it sounds great to say, oh, these people shouldn't make any money. But, you know, it, it, this issue has been litigated time after time, so I, I don't think that's an issue. I think there's I think there's some uncertainty though because this is a market where you can't get assignments. It's a sort of book entry trading, and I think that can be treated differently at times by some courts um, from markets where you can negotiate a purchase and sale agreement and receive transfers of rights or not pursuant to that purchase and well, sale. Well, with agreement. most stock, as you know, is you get all of the rights unless you have a side letter or you have language on the certificate. I mean, that's just the way it's operated for 150 years. You, you need to put a legend on the stock if, if it's not getting everything. Back in the old days, showing my age, I remember having to get this. I was working for this company, and they had to 
have this legend, which, you know, in the old days, it was a, it was a rubber stamp. And it said, this may not be transferred, blah, 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 or whatever else. It was about this thick. And then you have a big, big wooden stamp. And you have to, we have to take out every certificate and put that stamp on it. The chalkboard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I felt like I was in kindergarten again. It was fun. <laughs> I guess we'll, we'll see what happens. Matt, you want to add anything to this? Or to the, on the Fannie Mae side? I, I mean, my feeling, and, you know, I've been wrong as often as I've been right and mostly I've been out of it, is that I think that, that there's ultimately going to be a lot of policy deference uh, to actions taken by the government in, in times of crisis. It, it, is, it is where, oh, you know, the, it's the political question doctrine, it's where the courts are, are, are least willing to intervene. And, and I would just interject one minute. You, you're absolutely right. In, in fact, up until now, that's the way it's been. In fact, I just wrote a piece, uh, it came out today, I wrote it a week ago, but it said the name of the piece was Finally a Judge Who Gets It. And going back to the SNL cases that I was involved with 20 years ago, same thing that you're talking about happened there. These lower court judges just, oh, defer to the government in times of crisis and blah, 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 blah. But as you get higher up and the facts come out and some of these judges realize, as Judge Sweeney now realizes, as Judge Lamberth realizes, that the government had been lying to them all this time. That, that's when the, the equation changes. But you're right. right. But, but you're I, right. You're I right. think the bar, so I think we're, we're, we're in agreement. I, I think that, to, to my mind, what it's going to take to get taken, keep this win, is, is, would be a determination that there wasn't a crisis. And, and I could be wrong on that, but, but mm -hmm. I think if the facts bear out there was no crisis and the government was not acting in what an existential crisis, but... Had some, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. The had some opportunistic. on the side of the crisis. Had some opportunistic motive, um, but but I think you know once again, sort of the way I play these things is I'd like I'd like to see you all guys get a nice big win, and then I short after that win, right? I, I don't do it now. I wait until everyone's at their most excited and the prefs clear and you know 55 percent apart, and you know then it's cheaper to uh, to make that bet. But if the if the post suite purchasers have have standing, wouldn't that imply that? Um, you know, securities class action plaintiffs would always be composed of the current holders of any given issue of stock, not the holders at the time that whatever the event was occurred. And so, you know, any stock would always be trading with all rights that were attached from, you know, to any prospective recoveries related to a class action. So, so the securities fraud time, which of course is the obvious exception to rights traveling with, with a share, had to do with the nature of the wrong. The idea is you were cheated into buying or selling a security, right? And so it wasn't that the company was impacted. So it's kind of like who's the victim, right? So if the victim is the issuer of the security, then of course, whoever holds the securities that that issuer has issued, they benefit and it travels right, but, with but it. But doesn't the victim have to be either the holder of the security or the company itself? And if it's the company itself, then you need to have, uh, you know, derivative standing, um, but I think Hera, Hera, as I understand it, precludes that in this case. I think it's a fascinating issue, and I, I don't have an opinion about how it should come out. Uh, Rich, you want to weigh in on Yeah, uh, very standing? simply, I'll give you a couple of uh, data points. Um, I would stay long or continue buying the GSE preferreds. There's about 26 issues, two that people often refer to as on the run. Uh, just to give you some prices and an idea of what they've done in 2019, the um, Fannie Mae on the run has moved from seven and an eighth to the high 13s and has settled here right around the 1060 level. Um, there are about 24 off the runs, and for those that aren't involved that plan to buy and hold, uh, you can always reach out and I can help you identify which ones they are. <coughs> They trade at discounts to on the runs, uh, you know, most of them between 20 and 15%. Those, those discounts have tightened and they widen and you can play that spread. And, and, and when you say on the runs and off the runs, it's uh, liquidity. Really. The, the liquidity. on the runs are very, very big issues and the other ones are smaller issues. Right. And therefore li you get a liquidity discount. But in a, uh, at a moment of resolution, if, if they're all they're taken all out of 25, the they, they yeah. would all be pari and yes. uh, they would then, and the then you pick up that extra 15%. The equity I, I would uh, treat as a uh, speculative play at this time. Okay. And uh, Dave, you, you commented about it, but do you have a, th a thing on 
buy, sell, or hold on the on this. Yeah, I, I think I agree with the skepticism re regarding the common and that the preferred is a vastly superior uh, investment as to uh, Fannie and Freddie. I do think that there's a great deal of uncertainty about the timetable. Um, I think eventually you'll get par <laughs> on the yeah, prep, <laughs> but it could be 10 years from now. Um, do you get par plus accrued? I think you do, right? You no, no, you don't. You don't. You're not you just you, oh, don't, you don't get accrued, oh, but right. if you if you end up getting part in one of the lawsuits, the Lambert case, there's actually an interest clock ticking. You get interest from the date of the breach, which was August the 12th, 2012, at uh, I believe it's 6% is the statutory rate for Fannie and Freddie might be some floating thing, I'm not sure. But right now the accrued, if, if it went to that, is up to something like 32 bucks. So well, if it takes 10 years, which is not going to take 10 years, but but if, if you went it's the full litigation. It's only taken eight so far. It's only right. taken 10 so far. And, and Meritor only took 21, so <laughs> what are we talking about, right? Yes, I think that's in a scenario where you win the litigation, but there are other scenarios where you don't actually win the litigation, but nonetheless you're dealt with as part of the plan to get these enterprises out of uh, conservatorship. Right. And in that case, you just get uh, you know redeemed at par. I do think that there's a likelihood you know, that eventually at some point that will happen I think it's pretty clear that uh, it's not going to happen, um, you know, before the election. Sure. It's also clear that there's a lot of opposition on the, um, you know, I think the Democratic side to seeing these enterprises escape uh, government control. I think, right. you know, if you're, if you're, for most Democrats, they would much rather have entities that are so uh, closely tied to important social goals like uh, home ownership, and um, you know, addressing racial and other uh, socioeconomic uh, inequalities, um, supervised by the government, as opposed to answerable uh, capitalistically to uh, private shareholders. Um, and so, uh, I think it's very unlikely that they would exit conservatorship uh, while the Democrats uh, are in control. Um, and so you may be waiting for some future Republican administration to actually set these things free. And then you also have the issue of building enough capital on their balance sheets um, to be able to feasibly exit conservatorship. And that is probably in and of itself a multi-year process. Um, it can be accelerated through an IPO and you know, raising new capital and, or, or lowering capital requirements uh, on a one-off basis, you know, especially for these entities, um, or having a, a graduated increase in the amount of capital that they're required to hold over time, even after their exit from conservatorship. But I think that um, you know, there, are, there are a lot of uh, political uncertainties as to when they might be able to emerge. Um, so if Trump you know, isn't reelected, uh, it's at least five years away. Yeah, I, was saying, I don't I, agree with I, that I, at all. I, I think we could add this to our list. I think I think we'd all agree on this, perhaps. This that, uh, is, we could we could, just sorry, we could add this to our list of stocks that would actually trade down if he was not reelected. I mean, if a Democrat would win, mm -hmm. I think I, I, I would take that. That would be one if this was at these prices. Uh, a I think that by the time this election rolls around, this thing is going to be rolling down the track. It's going to be unstoppable. And as for the Democrats, all they care about is the affordable housing mandates, which is all which was there before this was a government controlled entity, and it'll be there. It's in, it's in all the legislation that's, not legislation, the administrative plan that's been proposed. And uh, Maxine Waters had something she sent out uh, for the spending bill recently for a um, uh, something called, um, uh, I can't think of the name, but, but basically a provision to keep them in, in, in conservatorship and she took it out of the bill. So the Democrats, all they care about is make just as long as it hand, if they continue to maintain the affordable affordable housing mandates. That's that's all they care about. So all right. So we just have to move on because we're running out of time for another quick. Richard, I wonder if you could just tee us up on an Intellistat, and then maybe at the end of that, just lead us into PG&E, and then have the guys talk about PG&E. Go to PG&E first. Do you want to go that one first? Okay. Why don't you no, start no. Us you up? have somebody else start. All right. So. Matt, would you like to start PG&E? Because um, I'd like to get Dave's response. To so I, I'm, I'm involved in the situation, so that I'm limited in what I can say. But, but I, I do think that there are interesting opportunities in the sector, um, uh, th things that are trading at discounts that probably don't make sense that are worth looking at. I, I think that there's significant anxiety among people who own 
uh, or have interests in, in power plants that are suppliers to PG&E that are tied into power purchase agreements. And there are interesting trades there, hedging people out of risks that they're perceiving that frankly may not be uh, that significant. Uh, that's something that we're we're working on in, 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 in one side of our business, uh, talking to some folks who are looking at that. I, I think that there are spectacular litigation finance opportunities. Um, there are lots of uh, tort claimant lawyers with hundreds and thousands of cases that, that are filed, stamped, highly likely to get significant recoveries, who are looking to borrow on their prospective legal fees. Um, and the yields they'll pay up to borrow on these legal fees are extraordinary. They sit, you can lend at 40, 50% of the legal fee they expect to get, right? Sitting at the, you know, and get paid 15, 20%. Whereas if you go off and buy uh, a bond, you are sitting, you know, sort of at a full vertical slice of credit recovery um, and you're getting a yield depending on what you think about make whole and other things that Dave will have much more of an opinion than me on uh, that, that could be a much skinnier yield. So, so I think that there are lots of fun things to do in, in, the, in the deep alternative space. Um, uh, I think in the on the run space, you need to be extremely big and you need to be the master of your fate. I think the thing that does not make sense is to own 20 or 30 or $40 million of PG&E exposure and just be monitoring your Bloomberg feed to see what happens to your trade. I mean, I've, I've never liked that kind of passivity, uh, passiveness in large trades, and I think in this case, that's, that's, that's folly at the prices that are out there now. Dave, you want to uh, pick it up from there? Sure. <clears throat> I think the PG&E uh, opco bonds are, are attractive. Um, I think that the PG&E equity is a very highly speculative bet representing know, a single digit percentage of enterprise value uh, that, um, you know, could, is really, you know, uh, has been vigorously uh, exercising its process uh, leverage, um, but under many scenarios uh, could easily be worth zero. Um, and that the, you know, there is the distinct possibility that um, either because of incremental uh, wildfire-related liabilities or um, the results of the estimation proceeding that's coming up in the first quarter, um, you know, the company's uh, stock of liabilities could grow. Uh, now we're kind of through the fire season, so, you know, the former of those risks is, uh, I think, significantly attenuated from where it stood even two weeks ago. Um, but I think you have uh, – a lot of uncertainty about how the estimation proceeding, if it actually is uh, conducted, uh, could uh, conclude. Um, and depending on the outcome of that, uh, the equity could be totally wiped out. And Dave, aren't the, aren't the OPCO bonds around par right now? They are. So the, uh, the play there would be just a good interest rate or some accrual? Or you get post-petition interest. Post-petition interest, okay. So you're buying them flat, at maybe at par, and then uh, two years of interest, you, you? Well, I'll give you a data point. Sure. So um, my clients were buying the PCG three and a halves of 20 um, at deep discounts. Um, they are now trading just south of par. Um, and we expect under s several plans that have been proposed that these just get paid cash plus their interest. And to complement that, we bought the liquid 605s of 34, uh, which are now trading at a premium um, they've traded up to maybe 114, and then they traded back down to uh, the low 90s uh, several weeks ago, and they're trading, let's say, plus or minus 105. Yeah, right. um, so and we like that scenario. I would continue to hold. Um, I agree with David here that the equity is for speculative trading only. Um, and then it wouldn't be good for me not to mention a little tip for all of you looking to buy for yourself in any of these names we've talked today, um, whether it's PCG or Puerto Rico or anything coming down the road. When you look at these names, always take a moment and look for the wrapped bonds. This is a great retail name. These, th these when, I, when I say wrapped bonds, they're usually uh, backed by AMBAC 
or MBIA, uh, one of the mono lines. They, they have the wrap by insurance. And it's a great um. retail name. Um, and the great thing about them is they will initially trade off with uh, all the panic, um, but they never stop paying. And there are a number of bonds in the Puerto Rico complex. There are a number of bonds, I think three in PCG. They're small issues. You won't get a lot of um, liquidity, but that's my tip. Okay, great. <laughs> maybe, you know what? Maybe we leave it there. We're, we're running out <laughs> some time. Uh, if there's any. Oh, and tell us that. No, no, that's another. Very complicated. <laughs> just, just, just give a summary. Richard, just give a quick summary. I'm, I'm really not that good on it, but it, it fascinates me. Um, because they and sev several of the, well, all of the satellite providers globally are suffering because the FCC really has control of the airwaves. And the C-band <coughs> issue um, is a very big issue, and a number of these companies want to sell or swap or change. And um, I, I think it could be a great business uh, but it has this dark political cloud over it um, where the That's FCC familiar. has, uh, there's a lot of influence mm -hmm. and a lot of people are into the FCC. Fortunately, they have a very good chairman of the FCC and I think he'll, he'll find a nice resolution, but the people don't like that uncertainty. Hence, um, Intellisat under duress and uh, several others. Just another example of the, actually, it, it just seems to be this, the theme it, it, every year, and I know Gary gives me grief about it, but th there is there is this uh, extenuating reach of the government into uh, our business, some of which is necessary for mm -hmm. proper regulation, and, and some of which uh, just probably actually mm -hmm. creates the jobs for all of us in the room. And just to add to this, I mean, w we all have Verizon or AT&T, and they're all pushing 5G. None of that really moves forward fast unless these airwaves, particularly the C-band, gets resolved. Hmm. Except now, aren't the Chinese, do we run the risk that they're going to be ahead of us on 5G because of, because of what you're saying? Europe's already You should assume what they already are. They already are. I mean, the phones, the phones in Europe are always better than the ones we have here. I thought, how did that happen? Maybe it was... I'm going back to my old Motorola flip phone. <laughs> oh, man, yeah. I hear the flip is coming back, but I... Uh, yeah, I, 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 read, like, I read that somewhere. Oh, man, I can't wait. That was so cool back in the 90s. Those <laughs> All right, so I think that's what we got. And if there's any questions, uh, otherwise, uh, yes, sir. Steve. Uh, future of M&A in 2020. Are we going to see more of it, less of it, the same? Mm -hmm. And uh, a subset of that would be foreign acquisition of U.S. assets. LMVH just acquired Tiffany. Uh, Aramco is going to have a war chest before you know it, looking at the U.S. market. Uh, how does that all play out? And if Donald Trump is the next president, is he going to put the kibosh on foreign acquisition in U.S. companies? That's a shame. So uh, let me just take the first shot at that. On the uh, on the M and A uh, activity, to me, it's, uh, the M and A is always uh, the best M and As are consolidations within an industry. So we need we need new industry formations. We need uh, a, a, ra a, a rash of IPOs uh, to create that. You think you can go back to the uh, 1890s, 1920s of the railroad industry, and then consolidate that under under uh, I guess it was uh, Rockefeller and uh, same with the oil industry uh, uh, you know, just the issues are you know cars and cars. so on now and now uh, the internet through in the uh, late 90s the th I think the thing that we're struggling with as an economy is we, we and we're the best at in it in the world is that the, the, the new formation of these new industries so I haven't seen a lot of those you know in the last 10 years and uh, so if the if we have a rat there, now there are some coming up but if we it, it, we need those new industries to consolidate now having said that, then the then the then the, the stabilized industries need to um, uh, you know when they need to cut out the costs then they will start merging and I think we're seeing those the sort of secondary of uh, just consolidating just get bigger but we've been doing that now for we being the the industries uh, corporate America has been doing that for the last six to eight years in my opinion I I, I think I'm bearish on big M and A volumes unless uh, unless until we have a big IPO volumes. I mean, we've seen some deals that have been clearly designed to get done uh, under the current administration, and, you know, where the companies haven't wanted to take risk of a new administration, a new DOJ. Um, you know, I think if it were to be uh, an Elizabeth Warren type uh, oh, president, it put the brakes pretty significantly on yeah. 
some types of uh, consolidating M&A. On the other hand, you know, if, if there's going to be a lot of uh, electoral uncertainty, uh, you know, for other types of M&A, that actually could be, a, you know, have a depressing effect. So I'm not sure how exactly those two things. That's, that's interesting. Just pick up on that comment. If, if it does start looking, this would be another indicator. If we start seeing uh, that the movement towards uh, uh, a Democratic uh, nominee w looks like they're going to beat Trump, there will be a lot of M&A activity. But, and it'll all have to close before the 31st. I think we've got a lot of private equity dry powder and a consistent willingness of private equity firms to pay up for their leverage. And if you're responsible for putting new capital to work on the credit side in large quantities, backing these deals is just intoxicating because you will get more spread per unit of EBITDA. Um, you will get big amounts of capital put on the pad that's not going to get redeemed. So, so I think that, that if you think that M&A is basically fueled by capital looking for somewhere to go, as much as it is fueled by synergies among strategic buyers, I, I think it's, a, it's got a decent tailwind behind it. And you need to have a, a very adverse macroeconomic environment to cause, you know, cause the M&A credit to go on strike the way an earlier was talking about oil and gas, you know, E&P capital has gone on strike. I think if large scale M&A capital went on strike, you'd see it, but as long as it's out there and they can they think they're getting better incremental return by backing these deals, these deals will happen. But but having said that, the capital has been consistent over the last 10 years. There's plenty of capital. That we, we, so to, I don't know if that'll change, if that's a delta issue, like you're changing. There's you plenty of it? domestic capital, and I think oh, it, yeah. it might go the other way. We should start buying more Asian, Latin American, Sorry. European companies. Now, they may not like that. Uh, all right, well, uh, hopefully it's very helpful, and uh, thank you very much. Thank you.